<laughs> uh, so I was thinking about skepticism, and, and if you couldn't tell this morning, I was kind of talking quite a bit about skepticism as well. Um, talking about the uniqueness of Christianity and how um, amazing it is uh, that the narrative and the reality converged and that forms the basis of our belief. Well, I was thinking a little bit more about skepticism as I was writing that sermon, so I decided, hey, why don't I just talk more about skeptics and, and, and just different things about that nature. Um, I was thinking that our, our society is, been, is pretty skeptical, pretty cynical by nature. And, and somebody was talking to me recently about church work and what it's like to um, have a church and, and a congregation all up here together in New England, how, what, the, what, the, what the work is like up here, you know? Um, what were the, some of the challenges? And, and I said, well, the, the biggest challenge is that there are a lot of people that just don't believe in God at all. You know, there's a lot of atheists in New England in general. And uh, a lot of people put their beliefs in humanism uh, rather than God. I, I think that has to do with, in some degree, that people in New England are typically pretty affluent. Um, they, they have a lot of income in general. Uh, it's one of the richest parts of the country. And because of that, people, I think, really feel like they can take care of their own things and they don't really need God, you know? And I, I, I think that came out, comes out a little bit all over the place, actually, in the, uh, in the Bible. When you think about the widow and she gives her last two copper coins, but um, she could do that because she could put her trust and her faith in God. Whereas people that had so much more had a lot more to lose, you know, and they, they just couldn't separate themselves uh, from that wealth. I, I think that cynicism and negativity are also, unfortunately, part of New England culture. And that's one of the number one things that I hear from people uh, that transplant up here, that get to know people up here. Uh, we, we, I think we try to sugarcoat it by saying we're real. <laughs> but as someone that was born in Massachusetts and raised in New Hampshire and currently live in Maine, I, I think people here tend to be prideful about being good hagglers and about being distrustful and always thinking that people have some sort of agenda. And I'm, not, I'm not saying that everybody is like that, you know, but I, I'm saying in general terms, you run into a lot of folks that are that way. I know that sometimes I feel like that, you know. I remember going, I used to love to go to flea markets and, and haggle people down, like, to try to get things basically for free. Um, you know, you take pride in that, <laughs> but, you know, beating somebody up on price, there's better things to do with your, with your life, you know whether you're going to pay $4 for a runner or $3 for a runner or whatever it is, you know. Um, and I tend to be somewhat suspicious too, right? I think by nature. I, I think it hurt me that maybe uh, in some ways it's one of the worst things about having, having been an investigator for 10 years is being a suspicious person, person and having to always remind myself and to remember that people are worth and deserve the benefit of the doubt. Um, and on top of that, the Bible teaches us that we should have a heart that's willing to forgive people. But I think because of this cynical and suspicious culture of which I am an adherent, to which I belong, I think that stories of corruption in churches tend to get a lot of uh, traction. Um, and, I, and I think that that feeds into suspicious, like, confirmation bias. You know, you're just waiting for something to confirm that all churches are, are bad kind of thing. And, and I think that the Roman Catholic uh, Church, the sex scandal that they had, uh, was very damaging here. You know, it was um, obviously damaging to the Catholic Church, right? But also, I think, caused a blanket negative effect on all churches in New England. And everyone, everywhere, because I think that people are just glomming on to the belief that, you know, they say they're one thing, but they're really another. 
Um, and, I, and I think that means that up here in particular that we approach people in the world with, a, with our message, but we're, we're approaching them at a deficit. And, and, that's, and that's too bad, but you know, you've you, you got to work in the culture that you're in, you know, and, 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 it, and it pays or it's helpful to understand that that's just how a lot of folks think. I remember when I was uh, when I first went to a Church of Christ as a a young person. I was taken aback by how nice everybody was. I thought it was like there was something wrong, you know. Uh, it felt foreign to me. I, I thought it was weird. <laughs> uh, I was I was a young man, then, uh, like I think maybe eleven or twelve years old. Um, I was I was suspicious of everyone. I was like, why are these people being nice to me? What do they want? <laughs> you know, what is wrong with these people? Um, and I I think after a while I came to realize that being a Christian is something that really transforms a person. It changes who they are on a basic level. Um, they don't act. Uh, suspicious and instead I, I think people that really invest in what the Bible teaches just become naturally more caring thoughtful loving considerate and, and I think all those are positive and good attributes to have but to somebody that is in the world that has never experienced that kind of stuff uh, it feels weird and foreign and when you go and, and all these people are being what it is to be a, a Christ a Christ like person and have the image of Christ living in them, it just feels strange. You know, it's it, it you just like what is this just feels off or wrong somehow. They can't really be this genuine, they can't really care about me, right? Um and, and I think that, you know, that causes some suspicion, too. And then people do that because they're trying to protect themselves. And, and I think there, that there's a lot of irony in doing that, right? You're, you're being suspicious because you're trying to protect yourself, but your suspicion is actually what's keeping you away from truly experiencing something great, um, something that's transformative for your life. And, and I think what is truly sad about our culture up here and its suspicious nature is that even though people think they're being clever, um, they're really being deceived. You know, the it's e you know people say you can't lie to yourself, but you certainly can. <laughs> you certainly can. And I and and as an investigator, I saw a lot of people lie to themselves uh, to use lots of excuses and things to justify what they. You can convince yourself <laughs> to do that it's worth it or okay to do something wrong. I think that's pretty easy to do. Um, you know, I know from experience. <laughs> you know? And um, Is my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, So you are a king. 
And Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, What? What is truth? It's, it's, there's the irony there, right? Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. What is truth? This interaction, Pilate is trying to figure out if Jesus is some kind of insurrectionist. The Jews who handed over Jesus certainly are accusing him of that um, in order to get him killed because they really want to get rid of him. Pilate is suspicious of the Jewish authorities. I think that's partly why he's also questioning Jesus, because he thinks they're up to no good. And I don't think he believes them. And being skeptical in that particular circumstance is probably right on. But after observing and questioning Jesus, Pilate can clearly see that Jesus poses no threat uh, to Roman interest or authority in the region. But he also is skeptical of what Jesus says. Jesus is there to represent the truth, to testify to the truth. And, and Pilate turns his cynical eye on Jesus and he says, what is truth? You know. To me, this is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Jesus told Pilate that he came into the world to testify to the truth, and Pilate responds with this snarky and self-aggrandizing statement. A cynical and depressing view of the world is something that haunts us to this day, right? This what is truth question. You know, we, we like to jump to that, like it's some kind of super smart answer to something, but it's really not. It's just casting shade at something. People in our postmodern world, they really don't believe in objective truth. And I guess in that regard, they had something in common with Pontius Pilate. They only believed in a truth unto themselves, your own truth. You know, you see that all the time, don't you? This is your truth, that my truth, everybody's truth, truth. In turn, they believe that all people have their own certain truths, and all truths are good. You know, what is truth? <laughs> What is truth, right? If everyone has their own truth, then realistically, objectively, there isn't any truth, right? There's nothing that's real. And people are living in this delusion, in this fallacy of their own mind, of their own creation. People that think they're too cute by half or super smart, you know? They just think they have all the answers by saying, what is truth, you know? Pontius Pilate would be a modern-day hero of contemporary wisdom, you know? Um, some cynical throwaway jab at Christ has become the profound source of worldly wisdom. And it is depressing that the people who think they are being clever are the ones who are truly deceived. I think Pilate's words are also a reminder of how much the world really doesn't change, you know? Um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. People are basically the same, aren't they? People think the same. There's nothing new under the sun. I, I think it's funny. A lot of people will think that, that, that humanity has evolved in so many ways. But when we read ancient literature, when we read stuff like this, read about Jesus, read about Pontius Pilate, the way they thought about things, is it really any different now? Are people really any different? I, I don't think that they are all that much different at all. Um, and I think people are super willing to believe lies that they tell themselves. They were willing to believe that 2,000 years ago. They're willing to believe it now. But the fact is that I think that the truth is available to us. I think we can know what truth is. Um, I think the Apostle Peter also says something um, pretty compelling about that. Oh yeah, there's uh, Pilate said to him, what is truth? Right. Um, 
in 2 Peter uh, 1, 16 through 18, he says, For we do not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from, he from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Okay, so Peter, Peter knows the truth, okay, because he lived the truth. He, he was there, right? He said, I heard God speak from the heavens as I was up on the top of the mountain with Jesus. He heard the voice of God boom out of the heavens. He saw Christ die on the cross, and then he saw him again three days later. He saw all of these things, and he was convinced of them, and he knew them. He knew they were right. He knew they were true. He knew that Jesus represented truth. And, you know, I, I think that we really have to take into consideration that this is not just got some guy pulling a prank, that even some of the most skeptical historical researcher type people with way too many PhDs think that the apostles believed what they, what they saw. And that's something profound. These people were willing to give up their lives and die for something that they believe really truly happened. And the question is, is that evidence enough for you that these people were willing to die for what they said happened? Is that evidence for, enough for you to believe that it happened? That these people lived their entire lives cast out of society, beaten, uh, killed, tortured, all kinds of horrible things. Uh, some, of, one, some of the apostles, I think two of them, were skinned alive. I mean, if you just think about what they went through, wouldn't it have just been super easy to just walk away from it if it wasn't true? I, I mean, for me, this is as real and as true as it gets. They believed it to the point uh, that they were willing to die. And, and that is something. They were willing to die for what they knew was the truth, right? Um, and this was a truth that he was willing to, live, to give his life in service to. It was a belief that he was willing to die for, and he even makes reference to that in his letter. Uh, if you go a little bit further down uh, in the beginning, it's 1 Peter 1, 12 through 15. He says, Therefore I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. He's not afraid to tell them what the truth is, right? And have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, as long as I'm alive, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. He knew he was going to die soon, uh, and they do. Uh, Nero, I believe, executes Peter. And, and this is written right you know, near the end of his life, within a couple of years. Uh, so he knew he was going to be killed. He knew he was going to die. Uh, and he says, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I'll also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. It's important to him that, that they be reminded, that they know what happened that day, what happened when he heard God's voice from the top of the mountain, this is my son in whom I am well pleased that they understood who it was that came out of the empty tomb. As we discussed this morning, Peter was convinced of this truth. I think that that is something that we can really take away from, the, from Peter, like just to really incorporate in our own life, to think about how we should be about our own level of faith. And, and be mindful to not let ourselves be skeptics and cynics. I think it's so easy to be a doubter. I think it's really easy to be a doubter, to throw shade at things, you know, just automatically say, oh, that's not right or that's not true. 
it's easy to dismiss everything. The negative part of our brain is much easier to appease than the possibilities of the positive part. It's easy to limit the scope of our mind and fix in on one little thing that we can't explain here or there. It's easy to doubt things when we really don't fully understand them. I think it's all too simple and easy to feed into our confirmation bias of negativity that I think we carry within us. You know, that's a part of all of us, right? And that's what Pilate did. He never sought to truly find out if anything Jesus said was true. He didn't care. He just says sarcastically and cynically, what is truth? You know? I think we need to be on guard against taking such an easy out. Instead of being a denier, instead of being a denier, we should be a seeker. You know, it's easy to sit there and say, oh, that's not real, but what does it take to get up and put some energy into finding the truth, going on a quest? One who is willing to search, not for our own truth, but instead, what is the actual, the real truth? And I think that in the end, at the end of our journey, when we've walked that path, that seeker's path, that we will come to the will and the wisdom of God. I think that we'll see that the Bible is what it claims to be, that it is the truth. That it truly is how people should be. It is the best way to be. And that its promises are real, and they're based on real evidence and facts and information. We really put in the effort um, to seek the truth, then we will find it, right? And that's what Jesus basically tells us too, right? Matthew 7, 8 says, For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. So, are we willing to be a seeker? Are we willing to open our hearts, open our minds, our souls to the truth of God? Are we willing to challenge the doubts that are in us instead of letting them take over? I hope that we are. It is harder to find a true treasure than just to keep sticking with the recycled junk that we already have in, 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 our, uh, in our backyard. I think that it's harder to find real gold. And if you're a seeker, if you want the truth, then I, I truly believe in my heart that it is here. It is in the scriptures. It is God's word. And God has promised those that believe in him and believe in his son, Jesus Christ, that if they repent of their sins and are baptized in commitment to him, that they will be saved. They receive forgiveness of sins the Holy Spirit, and eternal life. And if that's something that we want, if we want to find that truth that's on our heart today, if we're ready to find God, then I ask you to come forward as we stand and we sing.